Hi, I'm Nigel Vanderlinden. This is Collaboration is Culture podcast, exploring how we work together and how to make it better. In this episode, I'm joined by Max Sather, co-owner and agile transformation lead of August Public. Max works at the intersection of team coaching, leadership development, and org design to develop organizations that are capable of responding to the pace of 21st century. Through the implementation of large, complex change programs, Max has helped multiple Fortune 500 companies increase worker engagement, build thriving leadership teams, and develop entire new org structures designed for both agility and speed. Max, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Nigel. Great to be here. Today, Max and I are discussing the ideal size of project teams, an often debated topic amongst project management professionals. We're going to be exploring the relationship and sometimes friction between the simplicity of small project teams and the inclusivity of large project teams. Max, is this question a zero-sum game or is it yin-yang? In other words, in order for for one to benefit, the other must lose. I think, yes, there are specific circumstances when small teams organized around the work to be done are more effective. There are still places where traditional kind of department sizes uh, with reporting lines make sense for the work to be done, like predictable operations work. But we, when you get into high uncertainty situations that require a bias to action, that require experimentation, that require teams to move unimpeded by traditional corporate structures, then yes, that's where we look to create small teams, five to nine people. You've got enough for there to be a range of perspective, but not too many that it takes too long to make decisions. And we try to unleash those teams from you know the usual impediments so that they can fail fast, move fast, and learn as they go. Max, is there something about now, this moment, and and maybe the context that we're now working in, remote and hybrid work, that makes this debate particularly topical? Yeah, great question. I mean, on the one hand, this is a unique moment. And on the other hand, there have been a lot of unique moments recently. (laughs) And each time another one comes along, we go, wow, this is unusual. (laughs) Well... (laughs) No, unusual moments happen all the time, which makes them quite usual. These are sometimes referred to as black swan events. But they're really just a symptom of the pace of now, of the future in which we live. Things like uh, Brexit, things like uh, the Russian-Ukraine war. These have, as a result of globalization and the interconnected world, vast implications which can add complexity and change the way that we operate in our day-to-day. COVID-19 is no different. And so while small teams are helpful in this weird environment in which we're in, they've been helpful for a long time because of the increasing pace of, uh, of our existence. You know, before that, we had hierarchy, which was great. It was really good for 100 years. And now we're trying to find something that makes more sense for the speed and complexity of the world in which we live. So what is the argument for, for small project teams? There's a saying about committees, right? No good decisions were ever made by a committee. And the problem with committees is that there are too many voices in the room, too many cooks in the kitchen. The benefit of a small project team is that you are limiting the complexity. Uh, To put this into mathematical terms, you're limiting the number of connections between individual members. What I mean by that is that in a team of one, there are zero connections. In a team of two, there is one connection, one to one. In a team of three, there are three connections. Team of four, it goes up quite quickly to, help me out, eight, is it? Um, I think you're on track. Yeah. Um, they, uh, this is an exponential curve. And by the time you get up to 10, 11, 12, the amount of interconnections, the amount of different conversations you need to have, the amount of different relationships gets beyond what psychologists have shown 
humans can handle in their day to day. So by limit, limiting it to less than 10, um, nine is really the maximum that we advise, then you are operating at the kind of maximum complexity level, the maximum number of relationships um, that are really kind of beneficial before it starts to taper off. I'm going to ask you now to really argue the opposite. And what's the argument for large project teams? We can include all the voices in the conversation. We get so much expertise. There's so many people we can tap into and get their ideas and get and make sure we come up with the absolute perfect solution before we try something. Is there also an element of, of buy-in? By including more individuals in the process, you are thereby getting their, their buy-in ultimately with the decision that may come out of that process. Yeah, of course. If people feel that their ideas have been heard and ideally integrated, then they feel invested in the uh, path forward. And so they're more likely to support the decision. Nigel, I'm really having to bite my tongue here because everything I'm saying to these two questions, I don't believe. I don't believe that having more people leads to more inclusion. I actually think that what it results in is a lot of people get left out mm. or a lot of people get asked for their opinion and no one really listens. They're just checking a box. And while things like consensus feel great on the surface, wow, we talked to everyone. We included all voices. There's still a ton of people who are like, why wasn't I consulted on this? This affects me directly. And so it's much, much harder to draw the line when you get into bigger uh, like department size uh, decision-making processes or projects because it's not clear where the boundaries are, where the edges of the authority are. So including does not necessarily mean inclusion, as the case may be. Great way to put it. How does one determine the optimal project team size? Is there a magic number? And at what point does a project um, benefit from more project team members? Or at what point does it diminish? There's a few things I'm thinking about here. Mm -hmm. One is the easy answer is to say between five and nine people. At five people, you have enough diversity of perspective to make smart decisions. And at nine people, it's not too big that it becomes too complex, as I mentioned before. But that's just a kind of practice or a clear guideline. Really, the mindset that you should take on when you're designing project teams is to organize around the work to be done. Don't organize around the people, the personalities, find the folks you like, or uh, find all the experts regardless of what it is they actually have to do. Look first at your strategy. What is it that you really need to get done, both long-term and short-term? Like, what's your three-month goal? Break that down into specific initiatives, OKRs, if, if you're into OKRs. And then when you look at the initiatives that you have to work towards, what are the roles you need to actually move on those initiatives. That's how you come to understand how many people you really need on the team, by organizing around the work to be done and looking first at what actually needs to be accomplished. Does that make sense? I'm, it does. Um, I've also read or I'm aware of uh, one of the rules that I think it was Amazon or um, Jeff Bezos made famous, uh, two pizza teams, I think it's called. Um, can you tell the listeners a little bit about that guideline or framework? Yeah, so Bezos said that the the best size for a team is one you can feed with two large pizzas. Uh, the idea being that if the team is working late, you've got to order in. The optimum meal size is two large pizzas. Depends how hungry the team is, I suppose. Um, I could probably have one of those pizzas to myself. But um, <laughs> uh, the idea the idea holds as a rule of thumb um, for how many you should have on the team. So if if our goal is to both keep the project team small in order to simplify communication and decision-making and at the same time truly be, uh, let's say, inclusive, how do, we, how do we achieve that? What are, call it, you know, the strategies, tactics, or otherwise that can um, help us do both? 
So this is uh, a great lead into kind of where we start at August with our change programs, which is with these simple practices, tools, tactics, whatever you'd like to call them, which are very easy to pick up, easy to understand, but embedded within them is actually a profound shift in mindset about how we think about collaboration, how we think about decision making uh, and how we think about work. It's almost like a, a Jedi mind trick. Like you wave your hand, do a simple thing, but underneath there's really something significant going on. I'll give you uh, an example, which we call rounds, which we borrowed from a movement called sociocracy. And rounds is very simply the art of speaking one at a time in turn without interruption. What we're trying to avoid here is the kind of meetings where one or two people usually the highest paid people, have 90% of the talk time of the airspace. With rounds, we go around the room. So everyone from the CEO to the intern gets a chance to hold the mic, uh, to hold the conch, and to share their perspective. The underlying mindset here is that good ideas can come from anywhere. In a networked world, different people's experiences life experiences and work experiences um, should be heard and included because the combination of those will lead to a better outcome and avoid us making mistakes where we haven't listened appropriately to someone who's closest to our customer, for example. Um, so rounds is just a way to manifest that in a meeting context. To go back to your point about remote working, on Teams calls, particularly when so Teams calls, I mean all types of video calls. I know we're platform <laughs> agnostic. Um, on a video call, it's quite easy, A, to forget that someone's there if they don't have the camera on, or B, for that person to hide. And we do want to listen to what they have to say. In a meeting room, you can see everyone, so it's kind of easier to understand different energy. Um, but on a video call, using a round is a way to bring people into the conversation one by one and let them know that, yeah, their voice matters and we want to hear it. Just reflecting on what you're saying, I also think that that strategy of, of rounds enables the meeting facilitator, as it were, to draw out uh, each voice um, without potentially putting on the spot or alienating them. In other words, everyone knows how the meeting is conducted. We're aware that each of us will have to share um, our opinion, thoughts, perspectives by virtue of this rounds approach as opposed to being picked on, as it were. And to that point, you want to be accommodating of people like myself who are introverts or internal processes or people who might be a bit nervous about being there and sharing their ideas and allow people the opportunity to pass. You're not going to force them to say something if they don't want to, but the point is that they have the opportunity to do so. And like you say, over time, they'll get used to the idea that this is now how we run our meetings because inclusion is important to who we are and psychological safety is essential to our success. Is there a way to, let's say, accommodate or, or to better draw out um, those voices from introverts or those that perhaps are more contemplative and, you know, want an opportunity to process new information before uh, providing their perspective or opinion. Yeah. You know, to that list, I'd also add people from traditionally marginalized backgrounds, uh, people who don't have the language of the meeting as their first language and others who, for whatever reason, need more thinking time. A way that works for me is sharing proposals in advance. Let's say it's a decision-making moment. Having someone sharing in advance through your communication system um, what they plan to bring so that people can review it and think about it for a few days. I actually just sent a note to my colleagues today. We have a decision-making moment on Friday, August, a regular governance meeting. I sent a note to my colleagues today. Hey, don't forget to include me. I'm an internal processor. Uh, these high pressure moments don't always work for me. Please send your proposals in advance. So that's one way that we approach that. 
I like that suggestion. And also what I find interesting about that is you're advocating for yourself or you're advocating for the way that you process information and the way that you like to contribute to that decision making exercise. Is, is, is that role incumbent upon every participant or is it also the responsibility of the facilitator to ensure that we all know how we best uh, contribute to a decision-making process. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's like, if you're someone who doesn't feel comfortable speaking up, then you're not going to feel comfortable speaking up about the fact that you don't feel comfortable speaking up. <laughs> um, I'm quite lucky as a straight white man, I have like learned privilege, which means I'm much more likely to share my voice about my uh, personal needs. But I get that that won't be the same for everyone. And we still need to accommodate them. And in that case, yes, I think a trained facilitator uh, is so essential to operational effectiveness. And that's one of the key levers we pull on in our transformation programs with our clients is coaching programs, facilitation training, having people in the room to say, hey, sorry, boss, you've been speaking a lot and I'd like to hear from some other voices. Um, just so we have balance to the conversation. How do we, as a as a group or project team, um, a, a agree on how that meeting or that decision will be conducted? I mean, is it is it captured somewhere, or are these rules or guidelines written down and agreed to? Yes, they are agreed to, and we need to be open to learning and. Uh, adapting our own organization design which is what we're getting into um, based on our experience and based on our changing needs to enable that we introduce uh, participatory inclusive decision making processes that make it very easy for us to try out new meeting practices uh, we call it consent based decision making or safe to try where someone says hey, this meeting we've been having, I actually think it'd be better if it was 45 minutes and on a Thursday. Can we try that for the next month or two and um, see if it works better for us? And by using the safe to try process, we invite questions, we invite reactions, we make edits, uh, but we still find a path forward when, when there is disagreement because we're holding an experimental mindset. We're saying, even if I don't agree with this, it is safe to move forward and try it out, and we'll see what happens. Uh, and in that way, we're always designing and redesigning our own organization, our own ways of working with each other to uh, figure out what works for right now for, for the work that we're up to. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the goal is not consensus. In other words, the goal is not to achieve all yeses. The goal is consent, um, no no's. Exactly. Yeah, you said it very well. In high uncertainty situations, trying to get to 100% yes is going to result in us going round and round in circles, analysis paralysis, lots of politicking. It's going to result in having to leverage like internal networks just to get the work done, which we don't want to do. We want to move fast, break things, and uh, learn as we go. And that's what consent or safe to try enables. Is this somewhat similar or akin to... Uh, the disagree and commit that was also popularized by Amazon? Yes, uh, very similar. I actually use that example a lot um, from one of Jeff Bezos' stakeholder letters where he, they were greenlighting an Amazon Studios original and he disagreed that it was the right program for that time. The team had a different perspective and he said, you know what, I disagree and I commit to supporting your decision. And that's really important because what we don't want to happen is people... Uh, disagree with the path forward and then try and do everything they can to block it or slow it down. That that would be poor leadership, poor empowerment. To truly empower, you need to let the team have the final call, regardless of whether you feel comfortable with it. As long as it's safe to try, let them move forward and support their decision until it gets to a point when you can objectively say, okay, this worked or this didn't work. And then you can find uh, a new path. So reflecting on that Jeff Bezos example. If I mentally 
take the uh, position or the role of someone that was in the room. Jeff Bezos and his team must have created an environment where his team uh, were comfortable advocating for their own position, despite Jeff having a different opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you talk to me a little bit about the role of psychological safety in this process, right? Uh, Ultimately, that will allow us to keep teams small for purposes of simplicity, but include, truly include voices Mm -hmm. in the process. What the team needs to know is that there isn't going to be an I told you so moment later on, right? They need to know that they are set up to succeed and will be supported if they fail. To put it another way, if they fail, there won't be any repercussions. They may even be celebrated for failing. The innovation cycle requires a certain number of loops of failure in order to get to the right process. It's an essential part of that. So celebrating failure, harnessing the learnings, broadcasting them wide, owning up to it, that all requires this kind of bedrock of psychological safety. We've all seen the studies, uh, Project Aristotle at Google, Amy Edmondson's work around this, Charles Duhigg talks about this a lot, about how important psychological safety is to thriving teams in the 21st century. And that's because of this need to work through complexity, work through changing circumstances. The only solution to that is experimentation and willingness to learn through failure. Recognizing again the moment we're all working in, i.e. hybrid, remote, etc. Is there a role for asynchronous work to play? in pursuing the goal of small project teams, yet inclusive project teams? Yeah, two things come to mind. One is just that asynchronous work, by which I mean writing things down instead of having a meeting about it, to come up (laughs) with a simple definition, is important in in a remote world because it avoids Zoom fatigue. It avoids burnout. It makes sure that even people who need time to think and reflect have that time, as as we mentioned earlier. The other thing about writing things down is that when things are explicit, they are more inclusive. If someone's new to an organization, has just returned from leave, or for some reason doesn't have the context for a conversation, or let's say a working agreement that lives in people's minds, like you can expense lunch on Fridays, if that's not written down and you don't know that, like how are you going to find out unless someone um, mentions it to you in passing? So... Uh, asynchronous working, writing things down makes things explicit and it also makes them editable over time so we can change them. Much more easy to edit things that are written down because we can see them, we can look at them together and we can adapt them as we go to the context of our work. Your response triggers um, a a memory or or thought of um, GitLab. GitLab has been, I believe, remote since day one. And uh, at the point the pandemic hit, they effectively published um, their employee handbook, as it were. And one of their mantras really is um, iterate, iterate, iterate. And so by publishing their handbook, it allowed employees and even external stakeholders to allow them to iterate in a very public manner um, on how they work together in a remote setting. Mm. Do you have any examples from your consultancy practice um, of um, clients doing something similar? And maybe it's not uh, with their employee handbook, but is there any, let's say, success stories or or perhaps um, learnings from your client engagement uh, around the, the benefit of, of iteration, in particular in building inclusive teams? Uh, what I think are specific examples, like a generic example that comes to mind is around bandwidth, where when we design a project team, we try and get to the most senior people in the room or get the high potential employees uh, to join that team to help uh, move it forward at pace. We're aiming there for perfection. 
We're trying to get exactly the right people on the team, um, regardless of their availability. Because people are senior, because they're smart, because they're experts, they're pulled in a lot of different directions. Maybe don't have the necessary capacity to do the work required. So what if we grab an intern who's got 40 hours a week to figure this problem out and can have a few conversations and, hey, not perfect, don't get me wrong, not the ideal scenario, but at least the work is moving forward and we're learning as we go. So like how that plays out in an iterative way is we design a team full of senior people. Some of them just can't dedicate the time and we need to say after a month, okay, how fascinating, didn't get this right first time. Let's pull someone else in who maybe uh, can can move it forward. Max, in your own client work, uh, is there a framework or an approach you recommend to uh, determine or identify uh, uh, project participants or project roles? Yes. So maybe I'll start with the traditional way of doing this, which is that the leader decides. Uh, Top-down decision on who should be on the team, uh, which can be very quick because it's one person. But it can also be prone to bias. That leader may look for people who sound and look like them uh, or just access their internal networks, people they like. Um, and it may not like reach into the organization to find the development opportunity for someone or to um, elevate a person of color who may otherwise be overlooked due to our kind of uh, human biases. So we recommend to some of our clients, not all, this is quite an advanced practice, but it is one that we use internally at August, uh, a election process, which again, we borrow from the sociocracy movement. And uh, I can kind of walk you through how that works right now, please, uh, step by step. So um, once you've defined the work to be done, You've written down the initiatives and actions required to fulfill that milestone or strategy and then bucketed those into specific roles. We call them roles um, that will do the work. That's when elections come in. You start to think about, okay, who's the right person to fill that role? Now, this process requires a facilitator. That facilitator has been nominated in advance for their ability to manage the space in the room and uh, hold the process and stay true to that. So this process allows for selecting roles through open dialogue and through the idea of consent through safe to try rather than through top down decisions. Here it is step by step. Step one, the facilitator presents the role description so everyone has context and understands. Step two, the facilitator collects and shares all candidate nominations. That is everyone in the room gets to nominate one person. And they can do this anonymous, anonymously, passing a note to the facilitator. Then we go round again, remember rounds, and each member shares the reason in favor of their nomination, why they selected that person. Another round, members can share additional information. For example, context on other people's nominations. I heard that you nominated this person. Actually, I agree, I think they'd be great because of this. Or that person's pretty busy on all these projects. Maybe they're not the right fit for this. So we do another round called the illumination round where anyone can share additional context and information. Then the members re-nominate. They can change their nomination if they want to based on what they've heard from everyone. Then it comes back to the facilitator who counts up the um, votes from the second nomination round. And then the facilitator selects the candidate based on that vote. Finally, the facilitator says, are there any objections? Is there any reason why this isn't safe to try? Not is it perfect, not do you love it, not is it 100% amazing, just is it safe to try, do you consent? And that's how, we, um, that's how we make the decision live in the room and find a path forward. I know that sounds very weird. Like, let's face it, that's a really robotic, heavy way of finding the right person for the role. But we're aiming for two things. Uh, to be participatory, everyone um, has a voice and an opportunity, and to be inclusive, we actually listen to those voices uh, along the way while still coming to a decision in the room. I love it. Great, great example. Okay. Cool. Max, how can the listeners stay connected with you? Yeah, just get in touch. Max at aug.co. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. 
I post a lot there. Um, we have our blog, org.co slash blog, where I write a lot. And I am a lurker on Twitter, so that's not the best place. You can slide into my DMs <laughs> if you want. Excellent. And on the topic of writing in blogs, Max, is there any helpful books um, or blogs that you'd recommend on the, the topics that we've discussed today? Yeah, I'm going to be really self-indulgent and recommend August's latest <laughs> white paper, which just dropped last week. We've had loads of great feedback on it. Um, people are really excited about this idea of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion through the lens of psychological safety. What are the implications of your identities when it comes to how much psychological safety you feel on a given team? Uh, this white paper was written by my uh, colleagues, Tirza and Mike. Tears is our DEI lead, Mike's a co-founder of August, and um, it's available on our website, org.co. Awesome. Thanks, Max. This was a real treat for me personally, as I shared with you when I initially reached out. I'm a fan or follower of your work as well as August Publix. I really do enjoy the content uh, that you produce and publish on your social channels as well as August's website, and uh, look forward to diving into uh, the psychological safety ebook that was published last week. Max, thanks so much for the conversation. Thanks, Nigel. This was fun.